Tonight, I'd like to start by giving you um, a brief sense of my ambition in writing this book, what it's, some of what its main arguments are, and, and then read a few passages to give you some sense of the style and the content. The goal I, I set out to achieve is really easy to describe, not so easy to carry out. It, it really was simply to try to understand the impact of the Vietnam War on our national identity, that is how we think of ourselves as a nation and a, and a people, and how that, um, how Vietnam entered American consciousness in the 1950s and how it shaped identity from really the dawn of the Cold War all the way to the present. And at the heart of my argument is the idea that I, th I think no other event in our history so profoundly shattered the idea of American exceptionalism. This broad faith in the idea of national superiority, the idea that we are forever and always a force for good in the world, uh, a defender of freedom and democracy, the indis invincible and indispensable uh, nation. This was a, a, a concept, of course, that goes way back to the roots of our history, but achieved its heyday, I believe, in the 15 to 20 years after World War II. Uh, we came out of that war um, better off than any other country in the world by far. The, 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 the economy took off during the war, pulling us out of the Great Depression. We did lose nearly half a million people, of course, but compared to other nations that uh, left us you know, relatively uh, unscarred. And our factories immediately converted from the production of tanks and airplanes to cars and refrigerators and led to a period of economic boom that really lasted until the 1970s. So you can't really understand how profoundly the 1960s affected Americans without really understanding that broad faith in uh, uh, America as the greatest nation on earth. Uh, because the 60s really was a profound identity crisis, a kind of American reckoning. And it takes many forms, and some of which I'll allude to here, but just to give you a quick sense of it, uh, there was a poll in 1971 that found that not only did 71% of Americans conclude that the war had been a mistake, a remarkable 58%, a full majority, concluded that the American war had been immoral. So, you know, I think that part of my effort here is to, is to recover a history of dissent and questioning that is remarkably uh, lost to us. It's remarkable when you think of one, uh, one amazing fact. Uh, um, apparently, some 30,000 books have now been written about one or another aspect uh, of, the, of the Vietnam War. So. One of the things, one of the moments of self-doubt at the beginning of this project was, you know, how can I, you know, really contribute anything new to this, what, you know, exhausted subject? But sometimes, you know, particularly academic historians are, are uh, often likely to pick very small, small specialties, small subjects. And so what I quickly discovered is there actually were not books had, that had taken on what, uh, this uh, seemingly obvious question of how the war had affected us from beginning to uh, the present. And then, uh, so you have this movement from broad consensus and faith in America to uh, fundamental uh, questioning and resistance, and then uh, going into the decades after uh, um, the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, there is an, an odd thing happens. We, we really try to cobble back together again uh, this faith in America, American exceptionalism. And to a large extent, it was pretty effective. I mean, when you think about it, it seems impossible to run for higher office in this, in this country without uh, paying homage uh, to that uh, creed. Uh, 
I, I remember pretty vividly when Obama ran for the first time in 08, some journalist asked him whether or not he believed in American exceptionalism. And he said, oh yeah, but you know, if I were British or Dutch, I would probably believe that that was the greatest country too. Well, that, you know, clearly that was not gonna wash. He, he was you know, really beaten up over that response. And in, in subsequent years, he's, he's expressed a, a more kind of uh, un, unequivocal uh, faith in American. American exceptionalism, but I, I, I do argue in this book that it's a, it takes a different form. It's much more fragile, it's much more brittle, it's much more uh, defensive, and it's really, um, it, it's, it's underwritten by a, a kind of bizarre uh, notion of American victimhood that we have in the years beginning with Vietnam bec uh, and, and after uh, become the victims of these inexplic inexplicable forces uh, from countries or subnational groups that inexplicably, inexplicably uh, hate hate us, and so I try to uh, get some sense of of how this concept still endures and what function it serves. Because you know, one curious thing is if you ask America, Americans have the capacity uh, to be pretty self-critical about um, specific things in our nation. If you you know you ask uh, your neighbors, what do you think of American schools? I mean, you're going to have an earful. You know, they're just they're terrible. What do you think of our you know, roads and bridges? Oh, there's like, you know, third, you know, it's like a third world country. And, or what do you think of Congress? Completely dysfunctional, you know, 6% approval rating. So when you, you know, specifically people make criticisms, but th then when you ask them what's the greatest country on earth, still a, 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 a sizable majority of Americans uh, adhere to it. And, and some of that might be you know, explained simply by the desire that we live up to our highest ideals. But I honestly think we need to get rid of it as a concept. I don't think, first of all, it, uh, it holds up to the historical re record. I don't think the historical record really bears it out. And uh, second of all, I think it does more to uh, make enemies rather than friends who wants to be constantly told um, you know, that we're the greatest and you're not. And uh, the, the, the international um, military establishment that it helps to foster, which continues to include more than 800 for, foreign bases, American military bases on foreign soil, I think is simply uh, unsustainable uh, for economic reasons uh, alone. Um, so that's, that's the sort of overarching ambition and argument uh, of the book. And I want to give you uh, some of the content because I, I really care a lot about the writing and I'm very committed to trying to reach an audience beyond my academic colleagues. And um, I, I began in the first chapter with a figure who is now long forgotten. His name was Tom Dooley. Dr. Tom Dooley, Dr. Thomas Dooley. Uh, most Americans uh, might have heard the song Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, an old Kingston Trio song, which had nothing to do with the Tom Dooley I'm writing about. It's about a 19th century ballad. But, you know, if, I guess if you're over 55, and particularly if you were raised a Catholic, you, you, may, you may remember him. But he died in 1961. That's part of why he's now long forgotten. He died of cancer at age 34, just before, uh, you know, in the first, year, just before Kennedy actually took office. And that's an interesting connection because Kennedy often invoked him as a model for the Peace Corps. He was considered to be the epitome of um, kind of an American missionary. Um, even in those old magazine polls, I don't know, they probably still do this, you know, where they ask you what are the top 10 most revered people in the world. Tom Dooley often ranked third in the 50s behind the Pope and Dwight Eisenhower. So he was a really well-known figure. And he became famous because he was a Navy doctor who, had, who participated in something called Operation Passage to Freedom, which helped move uh, more than 800,000 northern Vietnamese into South Vietnam between uh, 1954 and 55. And he wrote a book about it called uh, Deliver Us uh, from Evil. And I think that book really gives us, even though now it's long, it's a forgotten bestseller, it gives you a very vivid sense of 1950s culture 
and this sense uh, of America as the good guys who are going out in, in the world to, to save and rescue suffering uh, uh, people. And it was a kind of view that, by the way, had very broad bipartisan support. It was not, you know, just one party, both, you know, Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, um, uh, highly invested in this view. So this is the beginning of chapter one. The first popular American book about Vietnam was a love story. Written by a young Navy doctor named Tom Dooley, it showed how big-hearted Americans could save a small infant nation with Christian compassion. Lieutenant Dooley's message carried the weight of personal experience. He participated in Operation Passage to Freedom, the Navy mission that helped transport more than 800,000 northern Vietnamese to the south between August 1954 and May 1955. Dooley gave medical care to the, quote, hordes of refugees from terror-ridden North Vietnam and vividly described their exodus to free Vietnam in the South. Despite widespread illness and frailty, many refugees drew strength and solace from their Catholic faith. Long before most Americans could find Vietnam on a map, Dooley convinced millions that the U.S. role there was nothing less than a holy mission to rescue poor and tortured Christians from godless communism. Now, uh, it turned out to be a brilliant piece of propaganda, and uh, many of the stories that he told were either utterly misleading, uh, even implying that Vietnam was a Catholic country when, of course, only about five at most 10% had converted under French colonial rule, mostly a Buddhist country. But uh, more significantly, he told a slew of atrocity stories about uh, communist um, uh, torturing uh, Catholic school children and priests, L literally he claimed jamming chopsticks into the ears of young Catholic children as they were learning the Lord's Prayer uh, and their catechisms. And um, none of this could be substantiated. It's interesting, even the U.S. government, you know, thought, man, did this really happen? And they, you know, they investigated, could find no evidence for it. Of course, this was such good propaganda, they didn't bother to tell the American people that you know, these stories didn't, uh, weren't, weren't borne out. But there were all kinds of other omissions uh, from the book Deliver Us From Evil that came to light, but only slowly, and that's worth remembering. The anti-war resistance of that era really did take years and years and years to develop and, and, and really only starts to peak in the late 60s, years after all these very, this very important early history uh, is, is being formed. For example, this idea that, uh, of Dooley's that we were helping uh, establish a democratic country uh, in the South, what Americans didn't realize is that, well, yes, a number of those Catholics would have moved of their own uh, free will, but the CIA was real, had an uh, operation in the North encouraging uh, Northerners to move South, particularly Catholics, uh, uh, because they wanted a constituency. Most of the Catholics lived in the North, and they wanted a Catholic constituency for the man they wanted to put in place as a permanent president of South Vietnam, a, a man named No Dinh Diem. So they circulated propaganda suggesting such things as the fact that the United States was thinking about nuclear bombing the north of Vietnam, get out while the getting is good, even saying that the Virgin Mary herself is, is moving south. And it's true, I'm, I'm not making this up. And this idea, of course, that we were supporting uh, a, a fledgling democracy in the face of communist uh, aggression Eventually, Americans began, a, a growing number of Americans anyway, thanks to teach-ins on campuses and small little uh, uh, newsletters. Before the internet, you had to have these things like I Have Stone Weekly and Ramparts and Viet Report and now all these obscure publications that you have to go to archives to find. But one of the things that Americans were slowly learning is that we, in fact, had not supported democracy in South Vietnam. In fact, there had been, after the um, Vietnamese successfully defeated French colonial rule in 1954, an international conference in Switzerland, and the Geneva Accords that were formulated coming out of that conference stipulated 
that Vietnam would be temporarily divided between North and South, but just temporarily, was never intended to be a permanent political and geographic division between North and South, and that in two years' time, there would be an internationally sanctioned election to reunite Vietnam under one government. Well, those elections were never held. Why? Because the United States and its ally, Node NZM, decided not to hold those elections. They blocked them, and they did so because every intelligence report they had, and Eisenhower, by the way, admits this fully in his memoir, every, every intelligence report indicated that Ho Chi Minh would almost certainly win an overwhelming victory, perhaps 80% of the vote, in North and South in Vietnam, and therefore the communists would come to power democratically. That was an intolerable result from, for, from in Cold War uh, Washington. So the goal became to build a permanent non-communist, permanent country uh, called South Vietnam that would be non-communist. Uh, that, that was the clear goal. Uh, it was um, uh, adhered to for 21 years and of course uh, it failed. Primarily it failed because the government, won, uh, first ZM, but then a whole string of, of governments after that, uh, never gained the broad political support uh, of their own people. It was never really a question of, uh, you know, are not trying hard enough militarily. Uh, that was really ir irrelevant, the, the military side of it. It was the failure to have the political support necessary to achieve that objective. Uh, the other thing is, in addition to blocking elections, it's clear that the regime set up by Nodin Ziem was hardly a democracy. Uh, almost immediately after taking power, he was going around the countryside executing people who had been part of the movement to overthrow the French. People who were in fact widely regarded as patriotic heroes in the South as well as the North. They actually uh, literally had these roving tribunals going around the countryside in the South in the late 50s uh, having these summary trials and executions all within a day. They had made no bones about it. They published pictures of it in the paper just as, just as a kind of terror tactic. This is what's happened if you, if you are considered to be a threat to the state. How did, any guesses as to how they executed these people? You think of the French tradition of uh, uh, guillotines. They actually had a guillotine going around the countryside executing them. So that was the Again, part of the awakening of the 60s was to recognize that we are uh, supporting these regimes, and not just in Vietnam, but in many, many places around the globe uh, that are repressive, in fact, of democracy. Uh, but it takes time, and you know, well through the early 60s, there is a kind of idealistic underpinning of it. I have a, long, I have a sizable section on the image of the Green Berets, which I don't have time to read from, but the Green Berets were, were really uh, iconic figures in the early 60s. Magazines almost competed to see who could lavish the most praise uh, uh, on these American heroes. They were sort of uh, uh, represented as kind of peace, peace corps, armed, kind of an armed peace corps that was going to go out and, and defeat the Reds at their own game, you know, out guerrilla the, out guerrilla the, the, the guerrillas. Um, gradually, of course, though, America uh, became uh, aware that uh, the, the, the political story about democracy had many questions about it, after all, uh, the very guy we had supported for eight years was overthrown in a military junta. We learned eventually that America had given the green light to the overthrow of ZM. And um, even more significantly, we're gaining a greater sense of the brutal and often very indiscriminate way in which we uh, conducted that war. And sometimes that evidence appears in sort of unlikely sources. So I want to read one passage, at the beginning of a chapter two called uh, Aggression, where I'm really sort of, uh, aggression was such a key term in this period, and, and usually, of course, it was paired with the word communist, communist aggression. Uh, for example, I did a search on the New York Times um, um, database which is, you know, now it's really interesting. You can, you can search going all the way back to its founding in the 1850s. Uh, 
you know, uh, key terms. So I just typed in the term communist aggression. Uh, and there, there are only about eight mentions of that term up until 19, for, the beginning of the Cold War, really, in 1945 and 46. And then from, from then, 46 to 1960, it, that phrase, communist aggression, appears more than 2,600 times. So, you, you know, if you're a faithful reader of the New York Times, you're, you're seeing that phrase at least every other, every other day. And, you know, the phrase American aggression appears, you know, a hand, relative handful of times, and it's always, you know, from a, a communist source, so immediately disparaged as, you know, uh, complete, complete propaganda. So this is the, how uh, the chapter aggression begins. Movie star Audrey Hepburn is smiling and radiant, dressed entirely in white, white top, white slacks, white shoes, a white jacket is draped over one shoulder. She is looking at us from the cover of Ladies Home Journal, January 1967. A banner across the top asks, would you believe she's 37? The inside story says Hepburn is not too old to change her once pure and inviolate image. All convention is rigidifying, she declares. In an upcoming film, Two for the Road, she will wear mini skirts, vinyl shorts, and also, are you ready? Has a love scene with Albert Finney in which she wears nothing. Even away from the set, she was seen fruging in discotheques and wearing all the go-go goodies. Times were indeed changing, and not just in film, fashion, music, dance, and sexuality. The same issue of Ladies Home Journal that featured the Hepburn story ran a disturbing article by Martha Gellhorn, a searing account of Vietnamese refugees, war orphans, and wounded children. It may have been the most damning expose of the civilian suffering caused by the American war in Vietnam yet to appear in a mass circulation US magazine. She was 58 years old at the time she went to Vietnam, and she really had to struggle to get there. Uh, Gellhorn went to one publisher after another, pleading in vain to be sent to Vietnam. It is the only work I want to do, she wrote a friend, but nobody wants it. I am plainly too old. Whether it was her age, her gender, her public criticism of the war, or all three, no American publisher would hire her. Finally, the Manchester Guardian in Britain agreed to publish her articles if she would pay for the trip to Vietnam. She went. It did not matter to these resistant publishers that Martha Gellhorn was one of the most distinguished war correspondents of the 20th century and had been covering wars beginning with the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. She covered uh, D-Day three days in when it was still a very chaotic scene on the beach. She was at Dachau when it got liberated. She, can, she covered a lot of wars. Um, she did go over, and um, her articles were published only in a smattering of places, but uh, amazingly, she persuaded Ladies Home Journal uh, to publish one of, I think, her, her most uh, uh, troubling and political, politically tough criticisms uh, of the war. And she somehow managed to, to, to convince them that her, her approach was merely humanitarian, not, not political, that she was just going to focus on the children. And uh, so let me give you just a sense of it. Here's how this amazing article begins. We love our children, it begins. We are famous for loving our children, and many foreigners believe that we love them unwisely and too well. In fact, we might be too busy loving our own children to think of children 10,000 miles away, or to understand that the parents there who, did not, who do not look or live like us, love their children just as deeply, but with anguish now and heartbreak and fear. And she goes, uh, she travels around to a lot of civilian hospitals and she documents the fact that many, many refugees from the countryside are being forced from their ancestral lands by explicit American policy. We engaged in the forced relocation of at least, this is very conservative estimate, at least five million South Vietnamese out of a population of 17 million. And the short answer for why is that we um, couldn't control those villagers out in the countryside and they were all too willing uh, 
many of them to offer uh, support, intelligence, food, hiding, and recruits to the uh, local, anti, uh, the local communist-led insurgency that came to be known as the Viet Cong. Uh, so um, part of the plan was to uh, put them on trucks, helicopters, move them into refugee camps, or just sort of do so much bombing that they would have to be forced on their own to move into the cities. And this was, in a way, th uh, actually thought of as a positive thing, a positive metric of success. How many refugees were generated was thought to be a good thing in command chronologies and justified by social scientists at Harvard like Samuel Huntington who thought uh, that this would actually lead uh, to an a, a, a improvement of modernization, that people would come from the countryside and learn urban life and urban values and consumer culture and, 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 and find new opportunities. I mention this refugee thing because it's an interesting contrast, isn't it, to this idea of duallys that were in Vietnam saving all these poor, suffering refugees from, from communism, which indeed was a huge migration, 800,000, but it's dwarfed by the, the more than five million refugees that we were creating. So she's documenting some of that, and then there is, uh, she's also, um, she's also uh, uh, writing about American use of one of the most indiscriminate weapons of the war, along with cluster bombs, napalm, the uh, sort of jellied gasoline, hi highly, highly inflammable, that was first invented during World War II to firebomb some European cities like Dresden, but um, 66 cities in Japan uh, burning up these cities constructed largely of wood uh, and paper. By the time of the 1960s, the napalm had, uh, thanks to companies like Dow Chemical, had been vastly improved to burn much hotter and deeper and longer. The gel, that it, the sort of snot-like gel that it throws out with the huge fireballs, if it lands on your skin, cannot be wiped away. It burns 10 times hotter than boiling water. Uh, it's just a devastating weapon. And it was dropped on South Vietnamese, primarily on South Vietnamese villages. I'll come back to that. But 400,000 tons of it, many more, many more tons than were dropped on Japan, uh, in a hospital she offers this description. Before I went to Vietnam, I had heard and read that napalm melts the flesh, and I thought that nonsense because I can put a roast in the oven and the fat will melt, but the meat stays there. Well, I went and saw these children burned by napalm, and it is absolutely true. The chemical reaction of this napalm does melt the flesh, and the flesh runs right down their faces onto their chest, and it sits there, and it grows there. These children can't turn their heads. They were so thick with flesh, and when gangrene sets in, they cut off their hands or fingers or their feet. The only thing they cannot cut off is their head. So this appears in Ladies' Home Journal, early 1967, and this is even uh, two years before the revela revelation, for example, of the My Lai Massacre, in which an American company enters a South Vietnamese village and murders at close range uh, roughly 500 non-resisting, unarmed civilians, most of them women, older men, uh, and children, a massacre that was successfully covered up by the American military for some uh, 20 months. And um, I also want to emphasize the fact, again, that uh, the, the sheer bombing in Vietnam was unprecedented and most of it fell on South Vietnam, the land we claim to be defending. Four million tons of bombs were dropped on South Vietnam. Uh, one million on North Vietnam. And I stress this because, you know, you often hear this uh, argument that we, and we did hear this argument, uh, particularly from Reagan and from uh, George W. H. W. Bush, that we uh, fought a restrained war in Vietnam, that we fought to quote Bush with one arm tied behind our, our back, or to quote Reagan, that we denied our troops permission to win. Well, there is actually just sort of one grain of truth in that argument. The best, the best evidence that they can rest that case on is that there were some limits on the bombing of North Vietnam. LBJ did kind of micromanage the bombing of, of the North. 
Why? Because he really was um, very alarmed by the possibility that China, uh, if the bombing were too aggressive in the north, might draw China into the war as, uh, uh, as China came into the war during the Korean War. And uh, so um, I'm not saying it, 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 the bombing wasn't significant, it, it was in the north, but the bombing was far more indiscriminate and ruthless uh, in the south. And I have, uh, again, not time to, to, to read these passages, but I'm particularly interested in the use of B-52 bombers. I mean, we have, we think of Vietnam as the helicopter war, and there's good reason for it. There were thousands of helicopters always circulating overhead. But we also, starting in 1965 and continuing throughout, through 1972, in the South, we were flying B-52 bombers, those huge strato fortresses designed initially to drop uh, nuclear hydrogen bombs, uh, from Guam, as far away as Guam, in the middle of the Pacific, a 12-hour round trip flight to drop each plane 30 tons of bombs over South Vietnam. And then, uh, and uncontested, there were no surface-to-air missiles in the South. Uh, the, the, the most dangerous part of the mission was the mid-flight refueling. It became so routine, the pilots called it a milk run. And from our sanctuary in Guam, we were flying this ruthless carpet bombing. Uh, of South Vietnam. Again, this is an example of some of the things that started to come to light uh, during the 1960s. Now I'd like to turn my attention, though, to what happens uh, in the decades after Vietnam. How is it uh, that a war that had been so profoundly challenged and had created uh, the most vibrant and diverse anti-war movement in our history suddenly got kind of repackaged in a way uh, that uh, was uh, palatable enough so that this idea of American exceptionalism could um, be recovered. The simple answer uh, I would offer is that we managed to transform the war into an American tragedy. So that instead of thinking about and remembering all the damage and destruction we had done in and to Vietnam, we began to worry about what, how would it hurt us? And it was easy to come up with um, some ideas. Uh, Reagan and others would say, you know, it, it was a devastating blow to our pride, our national pride and our, our patriotism and indeed uh, our power. And it is therefore incumbent on us to rebuild uh, all of those things. Uh, even Jimmy Carter earlier was once asked, do you think we should pay some reparations to Vietnam? He says, no, I don't think so. I think the damage was mutual between the two countries. One country that lost nearly 60,000, that's us, out of a population of 200 million, and another that lost uh, roughly 3 million out of a population of 35 million. If we had lost a proportionate number, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington would contain the names of at least 18 to 20 million people and at least half those names would not be former combatants, but women, children, and other civilians. So that, we have forgotten you know, that side. We pushed that aside. And the other, so, that, so we, there's this, let's think of it as an American tragedy. And then more specifically, the really, uh, I, I think, um, a, a way of effectively um, burying a lot of the most troubling memories was to say, let's focus on one of the key, maybe the key victims of the Vietnam War, and that is the American Vietnam veteran. Um, by the 1980s, and I know this because I've taught generations of students who've come up believing that probably, and somehow they've been convinced that the most shameful thing about the Vietnam War is how our veterans uh, were treated. And you know, there is, of course, uh, a basis of truth, again, that can sustain these arguments. Vet veterans were horribly uh, mistreated. But, you know, I would argue the, the chief, you, 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 uh, chief abuser was the government that uh, lied to this generation of soldiers about the um, origins uh, and the history and conduct of, of the war and how they would be received in Vietnam. And when they returned, uh, did not, and this continues to the present, uh, did not provide them with the kind of services and support that uh, 
had been accorded earlier generation of veterans. So too does corporate America deserve blame for the shabby treatment of Vietnam veterans. Uh, very few of them went out of their way to hire or train veterans. Many of them were scared off by the images produced by another big corporation, the mass media, which created these gross stereotypes of veterans as um, wacko, drug-addled, violence-prone. This is very much a kind of 70s uh, stereotype. So by, by, and uh, I would even say the um, traditional veterans organizations, the American Legion and Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, also failed to, to lend a, a welcoming hand to Vietnam veterans. And, and in fact, very few Vietnam veterans uh, joined those organizations and created their own. But uh, here's the odd part. Who in our post-Vietnam history and culture was saddled with the most blame for mistreating Vietnam veterans? Not the government, not the corporate America, anti-war movement. We have, we, we've been, many of us uh, have been persuaded that veterans returning to this country were uh, uh, almost inevitably met, you know, uh, at the airport by mass you know, groups of protesters who would scream at them and call them baby killers and spit upon them. And it's become a kind of article of faith. Now, um, I would say there is a little complexity to the subject. I do think there was some tension be between many soldiers in the anti-war movement. Uh, and, and I would say that, but those tensions were really based less on political differences than on experiential differences and class differences. A lot of veterans understandably felt, hell, I went over there, it was a brutal experience, and you were able to get along with your, your lives and you know, advance your careers. I, I, you know, and, and those of you who are in the anti-war movement, you, know, you can be pretty sanctimonious, and I sometimes feel like you're judging me as an individual rather than you know, really, as you say you do, focusing on the war makers in Washington and, and the general. So there were those tensions, but the idea that it was a war between the anti-war movement and the soldiers really doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Uh, but it serves a very important political function. It demonizes the entire anti-war movement, for one thing, and it also um, makes us forget that a very important component of the anti-war movement were soldiers and veterans themselves. By the end of the, by the, end of the Vietnam War, the, um, the resistance uh, among active duty troops, again, another part of the forgotten history, was extraordinary, unprecedented, and I really do believe was one of the major reasons why the government and the military realized that they could no longer sustain the war, at least in terms of large uh, troops on the ground. Maybe they could continue the bombing, but not the troop levels. Desertions were, uh, were skyrocketing. Um, soldiers were turning on their own officers, at least the most aggressive of them. Uh, some of the officers were not that aggressive. Even, the, even they were, even some officers were turning against the war. Um, there were many instances by 69, 70, 71 of combat avoidance, even flat out combat uh, refusal. So that history has gone underground. I would say, however, that resistance does continue in, in past uh, Vietnam, into the, even in Reagan's 80s, on into the present. And that, too, is another important history to be recovered. I have um, quite a few pages just for an example of a Vietnam veteran uh, who became politically awakened by the Vietnam War, came home, and became active in the movement against American support uh, for the con Contras, the counter-revolutionaries who were trying to overthrow the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and uh, uh, to oppose the support of the El Salvador, uh, uh, El Salvadoran government and its death squads that were trying to c uh, crush uh, their own insurgency. His name is Brian Wilson. Many of you know who he is. Uh, in 1987, September 1st, he sat down on a, uh, a railroad track at Concord uh, Naval Weapons Depot. Uh, to try to block uh, a movement of munitions down to a harbor where they would be transported, uh, well, to various American clients around the world, but he was particularly trying to block the arms going to the Contras. This was an act of peaceful civil disobedience. 
that had been going on for years, all the way back to the 1960s during the Vietnam War. And, and uh, ordinarily, the train would stop. They'd arrest you know, the protesters, and they would do some time in jail. That was the drill. Everybody knew it. That's exactly what Brian Wilson expected w would happen. He was even willing to do up to a year in jail, which he, he might have faced. And typically, these trains were ordered to stop if there's any obst uh, obstruction at all. Why? I mean, they're carrying explosives, so if you know, an animal, anything gets in the way, you should stop. But on that day, um, they didn't stop. In fact, they went to the speed limit was five miles an hour. They uh, accelerated to 17 miles an hour. Uh, the two uh, other veterans who were on Brian's side managed to jump off the tracks. As Brian tried to get up and out, he was sort of sitting on kind of a legs folded, couldn't get away. So he was uh, hit by the train tumbled underneath uh, like a rag doll, Ma miraculously survived. He lost both his legs, his cranium was crushed in, he broke about 17 uh, bones, woke up in the hospital four days later, uh, thought he was in prison, but then he noticed all these sort of uh, flowers and plants around and realized he was in a hospital room. So he's got his own important story that illustrates the persistence of resistance, but the, really the, the aftermath of, of his, uh, uh, his attempted really murder uh, and they did, by the way, uh, through court proceedings, uh, the strong evidence surfaced that the base commander had ordered the train uh, to run over him uh, based on the assumption that he was a domestic terrorist. We were using that term even then, by the way, and earlier. He was a terrorist and attempted to, he was going to try to seize the train. Well, in the after, he jump up on it somehow and seize it. In the aftermath of that, um, there was an occupation, a kind of, a, sort of pre-occupy movement, occupy movement, where 24-7, um, for more than two years, uh, people uh, blocked trains, every one of them. And more than 2,000 people went to prison. So resistance continues, but it wasn't obviously much covered uh, in the mainstream, mainstream press. And um, so, and, and there is an explanation uh, for, for, for why. I, I, again, I think it has to do with this um, very powerful conservative effort to restore this notion, as Madeleine Albright put it, you know, so it's Democrats and Republicans alike, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State for Clinton, that we are the indispensable nation, that if we, if we don't assert our power, disorder and anarchy will reign. We're the only people that can do it. And I, ju I just don't think history bears this up. I think more often than not, when we, when we, we assert our military power, uh, we, we create more animosity than friends, uh, we do more repressing than liberating, uh, it's unsustainable economically, and I think it degrades uh, democracy uh, at home. So with that, I will stop and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Seattle. I'd like to hear your um, idea of who wants to have these wars. We had the Korean War, we had the Vietnam War. Who is the deep state actor or who is it who organizes these wars? Okay, that's a great question, and it's something we should all be dis discussing and debating. And in fact, I would just add, I think that's part of the problem, as we have for 75 years now been increasingly deferring to an ever more imperial president and an unaccountable military industrial establishment, we're left out of that uh, debate. And I would add that I think the American public in general has uh, almost always been far more reticent to use military power uh, than the government. I mean, we, polls indicate, for example, that since 2006, the majority of Americans have wanted to get out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet, just as in Vietnam, the war is prolonged long after uh, most Americans uh, object. So I, I don't think it's the American people to blame in part, though I would quickly add, as I say in the final paragraph of this book, we're partly to blame to the extent that we continue to buy in to this idea of American exceptionalism, because I do think that provides the underpinning uh, that allows the uh, office of the president and all these even more unaccountable people in the military, industrial, congressional, think tank uh, complex. So 
You know, it's complicated. I, it's not that uh, somebody at Halliburton just picks up a phone and calls Dick Cheney and says, you know, um, let's go to war in Iraq. It's a lot of this sort of thing, first of all, it's just not, it's not that easy and it's not that kind of conspiratorial, but there is such a, a sort of a, a shared ideological commitment to American military supremacy, and this has been with us really since World War II, this idea that we want to be so damn strong that no one would dare to, to uh, confront us directly. They call it full spectrum dominance. That's the goal. We want to be dominant on, uh, in, in the, in the, over the entire planet, the land, the water, under the water, the air, outer space, cyberspace. That's full spectrum uh, dominance. And um, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily, those really, those are the deep roots uh, of war. It's the, you know, the effort to, the, the, the sense that, both, that, that we need to assert American power because we are the greatest nation on earth. And yes, there are, you know, the rhetoric of the, we, don't, we want nothing in it for ourselves, we have no self-interest. I think that the people in power understand that that is merely rhetoric and they understand that resources are at stake and yes they understand that oil is, is I mean, there's a reason why we we're interve intervening so much in that region over the last 15 years and occasionally it even gets admitted. Greenspan, the former, former head of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve actually admitted it in his memoir, of course it's, a, of course it's about oil, uh, he said. Uh, even in Vietnam, I have a chapter where I try to argue the ec economic underpinning of that war, which is a little bit more complicated and, 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 and a little tedious to explain, because it is true that Vietnam itself didn't have anything like the oil reserves of Saudi, you know, I Iraq. But it was part of a whole Pacific set of markets that we were very concerned about, particularly countries like Indo Indonesia, in Malaysia, but most especially, of course, Japan, the key Pacific ally, and we wanted Japan to continue to have trading partners throughout the region. Um, but okay, that's, that, that's enough for that, yes. I have a real short statement, a question, and a request. First, I think uh, Patriots is the most valuable book ever written about Vietnam for helping Americans understand what uh, people on both sides went through. In case you folks haven't read it, it's about 120 or 30 vignettes of uh, people from the highest generals and politicians on both sides, from General Giap to, I think, Rumsfeld or whoever was in charge then, to the people on the ground, the Viet Cong soldiers, the Americans who were on the ground there. Even looks at My Lai, where it takes uh, uh, villagers. It, they in a page or two, describe what they went through, and then on the other hand, the American soldiers who were there. So, okay, my question is, uh, let's see. Are you, you're a young guy. Have you ever thought about writing something about the Palestinian Israeli con uh, conflict or what's going on in the Middle East? And uh, my request is, please write that. <laughs> well, I am sort of looking for ideas. It's, it's not a, something I've specialized in, but it's a very, very important uh, topic. Yeah, I came of age just on the brink of the Vietnam generation. I turned 18 in 1973. And as many of you in this room know, that's the, the year the final American troops were taken out of Vietnam. It's also the year the draft ended. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a fairly sheltered... Uh, suburban town where I didn't know a single guy who fought in Vietnam and that even though I was pretty oblivious to a lot of it it was possible as a, a sheltered pretty sheltered kid in that in the 60s because it was such a powerful experience to feel the emotional undertow and I did at least in my in some emotional way feel that this had been a, a really a terrible thing that had happened and then, so in college, really kind of felt the, a need to, to study it. And also, that's my first book on work, working class war, was an effort to, to meet the guys that were not in my neighborhood, you know. And, and I intuitively realized, and it was a right intu intuition, that they could, they could really teach me about the real contradictions between what Washington was saying and what they were experiencing on the ground. Yeah. Uh, quick, two quick ones. Uh, the picture on the front of your book reminds me of the picture of the little girl 
running down with her clothes burned off and her brother behind her. Is that the prelude to that picture? You're, you're, you're the first person that has uh, recognized that, that I've met so far. You're, exact, you're exactly right. It was taken just a few minutes before Kim Fook, nine-year-old girl, runs out of the village of yeah, Trong Bon. That's, Trong that's Bong. the one that stays in a lot of people's mind about what we were doing there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Second one is when they're talking about demonizing the people who are anti-war. Uh, when I got back from Vietnam, I was regular Army military intelligence, and I got back to the States in the 60s and was head of a CONUS intel section, continental US. I said, what the hell are we doing there? We're spying on civilians. It led to the church commission and what have you. That was the allocated technology that they had in the 70s. We're way beyond that. And there's a real interesting little blurb done by The Onion. If you look, Onion, CIA, Facebook, they do a real interesting send-off on that. But we have really propagandized what's going on, and it's real simple to be moving from what we think is the really wonderful country off to this extreme neo-fascist kind of group. Right. Sorry to trouble you. Well, I did, the point about uh, ever more secrecy yeah. is right on. There's yeah. no question about it. The, the Washington Post did a um, multi-part um, series on this a few years back, and just the exponential growth in the, in the people that are doing this and who have clearance security and just the office space alone. I think in that article they said something that, that it would fill 22 Capitol buildings, just, yeah. just at the new levels of, you know, uh, the sort of secret intelligence operation. In, in, so. in the draft era, we had guys who were threatened with being going to jail or going to the army, and guys who had master's degrees and lawyers when I went through basic training. Right now, we've got a very narrow, skewed selection of people. The reason when I have an, on a war meeting, group, very little, is nobody's threatened. You don't have to go if you don't want to. If you go, you're stuck. Pardon me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. Um, with all due respect to your book, you seem to plow the same old field that we all believe is true. And those of us who are there, many of us were not there because we wanted to be. So I'm asking, what does your book really add to where we are today? The only major difference seems to be that in those days, everyone had fat in the fire because their son could be drafted. Mm -hmm. But we're on the same path today, and that doesn't exist. People can live their life and don't have to watch body bags coming back as they did then. Mm -hmm. and they don't have to worry about their sons being drafted. Mm -hmm. So what does your book really say about how Vietnam changed our society? It doesn't seem that it has. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think that there is a level of public skepticism that is much more pervasive than existed in the 1950s all the way through the mid-60s. And that's a good thing. I, I do think that there is, a, um, you know, as I said earlier, I think the public really is uh, opposed to specific foreign policies. My concern, though, is the one you cite, one, that it is possible to live in wartime and not be conscious of it because we're relying on a tiny cohort, really less than 1% of our population, uh, and not even asked to make any sacrifices, never mind the, the draft, but uh, no additional taxes or, or anything. Um, but I also get troubled by the idea that, that, that I thought, I think one of the effects of our decade since Vietnam is the growth of kind of national cynicism, which is different from skepticism. This is sort of a resigned throwing up of the hands saying we're in the face of a war making machine or uh, power in Washington that is so remote and so impervious to criticism, there's nothing we can really uh, do about it. And so, uh, I don't know, I, I hope you'll read it and you'll find you know, some fresh uh, insights. Um, you know, that's, we'll just have to see. Um, I watched the Marlon Brando movie, Ugly American, about a year ago, and I, at the time I was, it could be taken many different ways. Would, I, I was wondering how that fits in your mind. Are, are you familiar with the movie and, or the book? I think it was a book before. Uh, the Ugly American? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, f film to go back to. Yeah. And um, in some ways, there's some, some slightly subversive elements in it that you might not expect. 
for the early 60s. And, and I, my explanation for that, I don't really write about it in the book, but I think it's almost because our commitment there was still so relatively uh, minor, you, you know, these things could, could emerge. Not that the filmmakers necessarily wanted to, to write anything too subversive, but it was, it was, by the way, based on a popular novel that did take issue with, um, with the functioning of American diplomacy. And Kennedy was very interested in it, you know, and, and um, this idea that we, that the communists were doing a much better job, actually, of going to these countries and establishing programs and uh, getting to know people, learning their languages, and that we were coming in as, you know, the, the ugly, ugly Americans. Yeah. Hi there, thank you for being here. Um, I, my father was in the South Vietnamese military and he and many of his friends um, were in the South Vietnamese military and were very thankful. I feel like I was raised, I'm so confused because I was raised to almost view this as being a just war because these people were pro-freedom, pro-democracy and very thankful to veterans for coming and trying to help. And, and I feel like, you know, more recently, the more I learn about this war and the more I learn about the suffering of people in my homeland, you know, most of my family, they're still there. My family was split. You know, we had family members who fought with the nationalist family members who were in the Viet Cong. And I'm so confused because I'm still trying to figure out, like, where does the South Vietnamese perspective mm -hmm. fit in all this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I haven't read the whole book yet. All I'm right. sorry, but can you just offer maybe some context and how to understand what was going on with the South Vietnamese people. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I appreciate your struggling with that, uh, you know, that, those confusions and there are many people like you. Uh, so it is a complicated story. I will say that this book is, is not, doesn't devote much attention to the, the Vietnamese side of the war. There's more of it in that book, Patriots, but um, one of the things that I guess I believe is that Vietnam was betrayed in so many ways by American policy and really among the greatest victims were the people, uh, uh, your relatives, because they were drawn into a cause in part that they believed they were either, you know, there, there were, there were anti-communists in Vietnam. Uh, and, but their goal actually was different from the American goal. America went in there and says, yeah, we're going to divide this country. We'd, we'd like to overthrow the North, but that's not probable. So we'll build this permanent South Vietnam. Most Vietnamese, whatever their politics, longed for a reunited Vietnam. You know, some of your relatives really wanted it to be re reunited under um, a non-communist um, government. And uh, uh, Vietnamese... A South Vietnamese officer I met and interviewed years ago said to me, yeah, you know, I would go to my neighbors and I would say, you shouldn't trust the communists. You know, they're full of all this great rhetoric about equality and justice and liberation. But, you know, you shouldn't trust them because once they get in power, you know, they're going to be as repressive as anything we've seen in our government. And he'd say, well, my, you know, so my neighbors would say things like, yeah, you know, you might be right, but at, at least the communists are Vietnamese. Unlike those people that you're supporting, the Americans. And of course, you know, deep in Vietnamese history is this long tradition stretching back at least 2,000 years to uphold as the greatest national patriots those who had fought off for foreign invaders. And, and the truth is, uh, more Vietnamese perceive the Americans as really no different from the French. Maybe a different kind of, they're not old fashioned colonials, but they're bringing a kind of neo or new colonialism and they're used they're trying to put in place people that they can control as it turns out they couldn't really control all those you know governments that the communists called puppets they weren't really puppets perfect perfect puppets but they were they were there and, and really for, I would argue for no other reason than American power had America withdrawn in 54 had it withdrawn in 1960 63 65 as I wish they had, if our leaders had the moral courage to do so, a lot of this bloodshed, recrimination, and even maybe some of these post-war reprisals would not have been as bad. I mean, the post-war uh, post experience for, uh, for people that allied themselves with you know, the South Vietnamese government military suffered terribly. There's no question about it. I, I wouldn't justify it for a second other than to suggest that um, it doesn't offer retrospective justification for our initial intervention. Indeed, I would say our intervention 
exacerbated that post-war experience uh, for the Vietnamese and indeed had a role in, in making things worse in Cambodia uh, and, and helping to s plant the seeds that led to that genocide. So anyway, it is, it is a complicated subject and, and the Vietnamese who came to this country often have very mixed feelings. Understandably feel uh, in one way deep patriotism but also a real sense of betrayal because they lost not only a war, they lost a home. And, and many Vietnamese I've met really have a longing for that, you know, to, to recover those connections. And so I don't know if that's an adequate answer, but I really appreciate your question. I appreciate the context. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Over on this side. Yeah. I just wanted to express my uh, gratitude for your uh, focus on the notion of American exceptionalism, which I agree with you that it's a concept that should be put to bed. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your comment. Thank you. Thank you for speaking and for your research. I have uh, two questions. The first being, did you th do you believe that the Vietnam War was necessary and just war? Uh, similar to the last question asked, there, it depends on the perspective, you could say, or the person you're asking. Uh, and on a wider um, plane, worth thinking about, are any wars just or necessary if they're not dealing with genocide? And the second remark I have is uh, Citizen Four is worth looking at uh, and how war has changed uh, in the last 40 years since the t era that you're writing mm -hmm. about. Um, what has technology done to war to making it uh, easier to have and what will it continue to in the future and make it grow? Well, okay, those are a lot of questions. The, the, the first, I think the Vietnam War was fundamentally unjust and immoral and even criminal. Um, the um, question about all wars being unjust, I'm not a pacifist, so I don't hold to that. I, 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 uh, I do believe uh, in, in just war theory, though I think uh, just wars can also use unjust means. So even though, for example, I think World War II was uh, a just war in our history, I think we used unjust means and bringing it to an end. Um, technology is an important issue. I'm glad you asked about that. The American way of war, and this has deep roots, but it continues to be based on this idea of distant killing, technological killing, uh, and drone warfare is, is the latest expression of it and has, as, as I'm sure you know, expanded greatly. Uh, both in the scale of it and in the number of countries that it's targeting uh, under the presidency uh, of Obama. And we're building already new generations of drones uh, with plans going all the way out to 2050 for ever more sophisticated kinds of drones. And of course, you know, uh, technology, you can never really have a full monopoly on technology. It's sort of a wonderful thing about science. It, information spreads around, so it's almost certain that other nations will have very soon acquire that technology and uh, how might we respond if uh, foreign drones are flying over our, our skies. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, just coming off your American way of war comment, um, I've been reading a book caught by uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz called uh, An Indigenous Hist History of the United States. And she's making a point that American exceptionalism goes back to the wars against native people, which were genocidal ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. And she's citing a, a book, I believe actually called The American Way of War or something mm -hmm. similar to that, yeah. where she's talking about counterinsurgency warfare carried out against mm -hmm. native peoples, like 1810s, 1830s, as being the origin point of both American exceptionalism and the way America has been conducting wars ever since. Yeah. And she raises, and I'm just wondering, I think part of the thing with American exceptionalism and the Vietnam War is essentially the US lost the same kind of war that they've been doing all along. Good. Yeah, I, I agree with that argument. I, I do say that the 1950s was the heyday of American mm -hmm. exceptionalism, but it, mm -hmm. it can be traced at least as far back as 1630 when John Winthrop uh, mm -hmm. came to, uh, gave this famous uh, lay sermon aboard the Arbella where he famously said, we shall be uh, as a city upon a hill mm -hmm. 
the eyes of the world will be upon us. Mm -hmm. a, a passage that Reagan, by the way, always liked to quote, though he yeah. had uh, always liked to throw that word shining in, yeah. shining city on a hill, oh. so electrifying it. But uh, yeah, I mean, this idea, I mean, back to the wars against the native peoples, as far mm -hmm. back as the early 17th century, manifest destiny used to justify an aggressive war against mm -hmm. Mexico, uh, used yeah. to, uh, to justify a brutal counterinsurgency in the Philippines at the turn of the war, mm -hmm. occupations throughout Central America and Latin America in the decades since. So this is not, I'm not suggesting here at all that yeah. Vietnam is an aberration, a, you know, an, ex an exception to a longer history. So thank you. Yeah. I've always thought that Vietnam, the Vietnam experience, and looking at it around here, I think many of the people are of the age of Vietnam, whether you served and went over there or not, may have the view that the Vietnam War is a gift that keeps on giving. That we're sitting here tonight talking about it in the terms that we are, I think, fully demonstrates that fact. For me, personally, uh, like many others, I was over there. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that uh, perhaps my experience and some of the others uh, with whom I've been friends have much more, uh, a more subtle uh, uh, experience than what you spoke about here tonight. But I would say that I heard another um, history professor, uh, Professor Emeritus John Bridgman of the University of Washington speak here about eight years ago. And he commented with respect to, first of all, Kennedy and whether he, had, he might have survived, uh, would have taken us off uh, out of Vietnam uh, as a, a distinct possibility. But he also said that uh, uh, the period of 1966 to 68 unloosed a cynicism in this country towards uh, American government that, at least for the previous 30 years, had been seen as an opportunity for good for the country. And that cynicism bedevils us to this day. I don't know whether you agree with that or not. I have one other final comment to echo somebody else who spoke here. Um, I have a son-in-law, I'm a Marine officer. He is a Marine, I have a son-in-law who is a Marine officer. I don't know of too many people in my contemporaries that have uh, children or their spouses who are in the military. And I think that is a grave problem for this country that's gonna come back and bite us. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much for your comment. Just to follow up on a little bit of that, uh, I think the divide between the civilian population and the military one is greater than it's ever been in our history. I think we need to have discussion and dialogue with people, you know, who represent different points of view, so I really appreciate your, your comments. I, I do think, however, that the, the government-sponsored efforts to commemorate military service are often empty gestures. We're instructed every day in various ways to, uh, every time we see someone in uniform, to say thank you for your service. That demands nothing of us. Nothing of us. I would suggest that the better thing to say is, nice to meet you, would you be willing to tell me about your service? And, and then, then discussion, then democracy can, can, be, can begin and might begin to help to bridge that, that divide. I also think you're right to say that trust in government was decisively affected by the Vietnam War and we have polls to support it. Up until about 1963 or 64, when asked whether or not you trust the government to do the right thing, uh, 75 percent of Americans routinely said yes. By 1973, that fell down to about one-third and has remained the same ever since. In some ways, I think that's a good thing because it reflects a healthy skepticism. But I also think it reflects a sort of cynicism that government can never really represent us and be uh, a force for, for, for good at home. There's a great irony here. We have, I think, deferred to the executive branch enormous power in the formulation and execution of foreign policy. At the same time, Congress has hamstrung presidents on domestic policy. 
is a, is a very odd thing. I'm calling, I want Congress to, to really exercise more of its authority on foreign policy, uh, but it's this weird, it's this weird flip. Hi, I, I, uh, just as a matter of reference, I, I was in high school in 69 and graduated in 73, so right during that era, and my brother was in Vietnam, but he was a pilot. But uh, I just wanted to say, it seems like there's sort of a culture within the, I don't know, it's the CIA or the military or wherever they come from, that they're looking for the next problem. Before it was the domino theory or communists, they were terrible. Then it was terrorists someplace. And like you said, communist aggression, and all of a sudden we're hearing ISIS. You know, we didn't hear about ISIS, what, a year or two ago? Yeah. And everything. So it's like they're searching something out. And so our leaders get information that says, I got to do something because mm -hmm. the, the media's on them. I guess I'd be curious in terms of what do you think of the training and what do you think of the media and all of that? Thank you. I, I'm not sure this really addresses your question, but I, I'm really troubled by the deep divide between what is talked about and debated beyond our access in secret, and then how those same people talk to us about, you know, the world. And, you know, to go back to Vietnam, one of the most basic facts of that war that still is not widely known is that the policymakers themselves, with a few odd exceptions like Walt Rostow, had very little confidence that the United States could achieve its objectives in South Vietnam, at least not in any time soon. You know, even the most optimistic uh, predictions were 5, 10, 15 years off, and that was really just to establish some more stability, not to really achieve the goal, which was to put in place a government that could stand on its own without massive American military intervention. So in private, LBJ and McNamara are saying things are going to hell in a handbasket and the best we can do is delay or avert defeat and only if we add an extra 100,000 or 200 or eventually 300,000 people. And they lied about it. There, uh, Dan Ellsberg in his memoir tells an extraordinary story in 1966 McNamara went off to Saigon on one of his, one of his routine fact-finding missions. On the way home in the plane, he calls Mac, uh, Ellsberg to the back of the plane to sit with him and says, listen, I've just been talking to these guys and it's my view that things this year, 1966, are worse now than they were a year ago. They're, because we've added 100,000 troops and nothing's improved. So even if we think it's the same, it's actually worse. What do you think, Dan? Well, I agree, that makes, that makes perfect sense. A few minutes later, the plane lands. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara steps out onto the tarmac in front of a group of journalists and microphones and says, gentlemen, just returned from Saigon and I'm happy to announce that things in every, by every measure are better this year than they were last year. And that, that, that is, you know, you could just pile up the examples of, of, of that flat out contradiction between the public, public optimism and the private skepticism. As you know, but perhaps many in the audience don't know, the Department of Defense is leading an effort to commemorate Vietnam beginning this year or last year for a 13 year celebration of Vietnam and its um, um, people have called it a whitewash, but that's what the, it looks like it's happening. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, I do think it's a whitewash. If you go to the website where the Pentagon has put this up, this, by the way, has been funded and approved by Congress to the tune of $65 million, and it's a, designed to have a series of events starting, especially starting this Memorial Day lasting through Veterans Day 2017, but really it's a 13-year project that'll continue to go in some form until 2025. That's how you have to, to commemorate a long war, you've got to have it stretch over a long time. But how do you commemorate a war that most people at the time uh, thought was an unmitigated disaster, even the people who supported it? Uh, the answer is simple. You block out all the troubling memories, all the troubling history, and focus on one thing. And this is the number one goal. If you go to the website, number one goal for the 50th year commemoration of the Vietnam War, honor the service and sacrifice of American veterans and their families. Number two goal, honor hometown, home front contributions to the war effort. Goal number three, 
recognize and honor the advances in medicine and science and technology that were brought about because of the Vietnam uh, War. Um, and that's, that's about it. And they have an interactive website and sort of date by date cavalcade of dates. And in this sense, it's not a total whitewash. I mean, they, they, they know they have to, they do actually mention My Lai, not as a massacre, but as an, uh, as an event that, 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 that killed, I think they say hundreds. Uh, but it's only three lines long. And it really focuses on William Calley and doesn't say anything about how something like that might happen. And, and then on that same page, there are, um, uh, they honor seven American uh, recipients of our highest military award, the Medal of Honor. And when you click on those, you get not just the name, but the full official citation of what they did. So the way it's framed, you know, it is, uh, to, to my mind, um, yeah, a whitewash. If I, if I could just follow that up on a quick comment. Uh, I and Dan Gilman, who's a member of VFP 92, about a year ago attended a symposium like this at Seattle University. And one of the presenters there was a colonel or a lieutenant colonel from Fort Lewis. Uh, and one of the things he said, in, the, in, in addition to the usual um, boilerplate about patriotism, was that the anti-war movement, and I've got the quote, I got a text of his speech, the anti-war movement killed as many people as we did in Vietnam. This is a college-educated officer representing the United States and the Department of the Army at a prestigious Jesuit university, making statements like that. And for anybody who wants to talk to me afterwards, I can send you the, the uh, electronic file for that, those remarks. The, the only thing I will add, and maybe we'll wrap it up, is that um, there is a pushback to this Pentagon commemoration. And as a lot of you know, the, Veterans for Peace has launched a project called uh, Full Disclosure, which is a kind of alternative uh, commemoration of the war with an effort to you know, introduce um, you know, critical perspectives on, on that, that history. And so I, I, you know, I, I, I hope it does actually generate uh, uh, some, some open discussion and, and, and debate. You know, I'm a little skeptical that it'll get sort of ignored and seem in our own time to be either uh, redundant or, or, or irrelevant, but uh, it's very much worth pursuing, and I intend to participate as much as I can. So, so thank you very much. It's been a great honor.